You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. This year, build your credit history with the Chime Secured Credit Builder Visa Credit Card. No credit checks to apply. Get started at Chime.com slash build. The Chime Credit Builder Visa Credit Card is issued by the Bancorp Bank N.A. or Stride Bank N.A. members FDIC. Chime checking account and 200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Great War Premium, episode number 22. We have come now to the end of our episodes on the evolution of doctrine during the war. Over the course of the last four episodes, we've talked about the British, the French, the German, and the Austrian preparation and persecution of the war. During our introduction episode, which was episode 17, I said that we would attempt to answer these three questions for each country. First, how they came to their military doctrine with which they started the war. Second, how and why they changed these practices during the war. And then we would take stock of where they were by the end of the war. With this in mind, I'm going to try to answer these questions again. But instead of focusing on each country, I will instead be comparing and contrasting the various countries around Europe, who all had to try and solve some of the very same problems. We will then close out this episode by discussing some of the misconceptions about the war that seem to be pervasive. Lions led by donkeys, the superiority of the German soldier, etc. I have really enjoyed creating these episodes on military doctrine. It's probably my favorite set of premium episodes so far. For those of you who are curious, next month we will begin a series on the artillery during the war, where we will deep dive, um, much like we have with cavalry tanks and railways already. Leading up to the war, each country had to try and determine how they were going to make war in the future. Every country had some roughly the same inputs. They had the experiences of Europeans in the Boer Wars, the Russo-Japanese War, the Balkan Wars, and of course the Franco-Prussian War. What I find to be surprising is that all of the countries came up with roughly the same answers from these inputs. Every country came to the conclusion that the offensive was the only path forward, and that the offensive must be pursued at all cost. This was not an incorrect evaluation. If you look at wars throughout history from ancient times until today, it is often the case that the army that can maintain the initiative and keep the enemy on their back foot often comes out victorious. There were facts that the military leaders in every country did not consider, although it manifested in different ways. First of these facts was simply the number of men that would be involved, far more men than any armed conflict in history, and this would affect the situation in ways that they could not account for. For the Germans, the piece that they overlooked was how vast the distance would have to be as they tried to surround an army of millions in their opening attacks. In previous smaller wars, the Schlieffen plan may have been sufficient, but since the French army was just as numerous as the Germans, and they had the advantage of interior lines, they were able to move troops around faster than the Germans could advance. The French also did not fully comprehend the size of the armies that would be used during the war. They believed that by attacking through Belgium, the German army south of the Ardennes would be too weak to meet their offensive. They were also incorrect in this assessment. Even with the needs of the Eastern Front, the Germans were more than capable of standing against the French attack. In many ways, they were too strong in the south, robbing the right wing of the troops that they needed. For the Austrians, it meant that the Russians would be able to absorb the Austrian offensives, almost regardless of how successful they were, and then the Austrians would be in trouble. And for the British, well... They would just not have enough men in the military, and they would have to fix that very quickly. In each of these situations, the commanders were not able to fix the problem. The problem that the enemy simply had too many men for the traditional battle of maneuver, wearing down, and then decisive attacks. This inability to determine a solution would lead to the French and British attempting breakthrough battles, then the Germans attempting at Verdun, where they tried something at least a little different. The evolution of the Entente attacks was evidence of them trying to figure out a solution to the problem. They tried first by scaling everything up, the number of men, the amount of artillery, while the Germans tried something different at Verdun by counting on the artillery to slowly wear down the French before the infantry even attacked. Speaking of artillery, every country would discount the role of heavy guns in the next war. 
Even the Germans, who were more prepared with large artillery guns, only created them because they had some specific obstacles in mind that they were going to use them on. They knew that they would have to go through the Belgian fortifications right at the beginning of the war, and probably French fortifications after that. This led to the creation of some of the massive siege guns that were used at Liège and Antwerp and Verdun. Just like the French, they believed that it would not be the large guns that would be used after these fortification lines were breached. Instead, they believed it would be the job of the field guns after that. This led the French to create the 75mm gun, the best field gun before the war. But these guns would be the wrong wars, for, wrong guns for the war ahead, and they would be firing the wrong type of ammunition, with far too much faith put in the power of shrapnel shells, which would also have almost no effect against men in trenches. Before the war, no army put much time into a job that would become synonymous with artillery during the war, cutting barbed wire. Cutting the wire would be an area that would require a lot of thought and practice once the war started, and it was barely considered before 1914. The British, for example, would not truly figure out how to break down the wire until 1917. Everybody knew that they were going to use barbed wire for defensive purposes, and knew that the enemy would as well, but nobody ever thought that the war would slow down enough for the enemy to pile up the amounts that would happen by the end of the war. But that's enough talk about the situation before the war. The important part is what each nation did once the war started. The first thing to discuss is the ability of each army to test new ideas. The French and British get a lot of criticism for their role in the war and of their huge attacks on the Western Front. One of the biggest issues was how difficult it was for them to test new ideas on the scale on which they were required. By the end of 1915, they had made one mistake that would doom them to two years of failures. The simple misbelief that bigger was better. Due to this belief, they robbed themselves of the ability to rapidly test new ideas and to iterate on those ideas. 1916 is a fantastic example. The British and the French without Verdun would have spent the first half of the year, or nine months as originally planned, preparing for just one attack. This attack would end up being based on false assumptions and unattainable goals, but because they both believed that it was only through these massive attacks that they could achieve victory, they would only have one chance to try it in 1916. When it failed, and to be clear, the Battle of the Somme, as originally envisioned as a breakthrough battle, would fail by the end of September, they would have to wait nine months to try again in the spring of 1917. This restricted their ability to test and evaluate new ideas, they believed that small attacks could not teach them anything because it was only large attacks that would make a difference. The German army, on the other hand, had multiple opportunities to test and try new ideas. Sure, they didn't attack much in the West, but the Russian, Romanian, and later even the Italian front would provide them with multiple opportunities to test their theories, away from the bloodletting in the West. For the first three years of the war, they would launch multiple attacks every year on the Eastern Front, against an admittedly lesser foe than the French and the British. They were then able to learn things from these successful attacks, something that the Entente could only do through failure. They were then able to turn these successes into meaningful change in their military, due to the strength and power of their general staff and their institutional learning concepts. They were also benefited in 1917 and 1918 from being able to bring in generals who were not shaped by the problems of the Western Front. The Eastern Front was so different than the West that generals had completely different experiences there. This meant that they came to believe different ideas and could bring those in a new viewpoint to the situation in the West. Sometimes this worked, like Brickmuller and the artillery, and the move away from the long bombardments and unachievable objectives of the artillery from before. This is why I personally don't think replacing General Haig for the British or Joffre for the French at an earlier point in the war would have made that much of a difference. The one example we have of this kind of change resulted in Neville, really just a carbon copy of 1914 Joffre. In, if Haig would have been replaced, it probably would have been by a general who held many of the same beliefs, because he had experienced much the same things as Haig had in four years of fighting on the Western Front. The Germans were able to bring in people like Ludendorff, who even though he had a lot of problems, at least he brought in different views, widely divergent from what came before. I don't really want to oversell his ability to learn and adapt, though. 
The fact that remains that regardless of the progress that, that was made by the Germans in 1918, they had not solved the major problems of the Western Front. They had found some ways to crack the door open, infiltration tactics being a primary reason, but they could not open it all the way and get through. I like to describe it as, by 1917, the Entente had solved step one, how to attack the first few trenches, capture them, and hold them against enemy counterattacks. By spring 1918, the Germans had solved step two, how to keep that attack going to get past the enemy trenches and to continue to push forward for a while. The British would also solve this problem in a slightly different way in 1918, through the use of tanks, planes, and other forms of mechanization. However, no army in the First World War was able to figure out step three, how to turn that tactical level advance into any kind of strategic victory. As it was, many of the countries would reach the end of their abilities to wage war before they could really find any sort of answer. The French would run out of manpower, and by the end of the war, their country as a whole would be exhausted. The Austrians would run out of food and material, their men would be starving at the front, wearing out their uniforms, with nothing to replace them. The Italians would similarly be running out of men to send to the front. The Germans would put everything they had into their 1918 offensives. And while they got through step two, they got the door a little open, they would fail. And after they had failed, they would be lacking the food, the men, the material, or the societal will to continue. The British would be less affected by some of this, but without the Americans, they could not have won the war alone in 1918, and probably would have been out of men in 1919 as well. It is this last problem that I believe to be unsolvable with the tools available to the armies of the First World War, that taking of a victory on the front and turning it into a strategic or operational level victory. Some of their armies had pushed their technology as far as they could in 1918. While the French, Italians, and Austrians had all made improvements in their military, it would be the British and Germans that were the standouts. The Germans had introduced infiltration tactics. This was the best way to use artillery for a breakthrough and they had nearly achieved one. These tactics would be the genesis of infantry tactics in future wars, as it provided them with more mobility and did not simply rely on mass to break through an enemy line. The British took a different path and instead optimized around mechanization. This can be seen in many battles of 1918, not just from the British, but also from the Australians, New Zealanders, and Canadians. By starting to solve the issues around getting tanks, planes, infantry, artillery, all of them to their maximum potential on the battlefield, the fighting of late summer 1918 was the genesis of the combined armed doctrine that would be the root of the doctrine for the Second World War for most of the armies. Unfortunately for the men in the armies during the First World War, no matter how much any of their armies optimized or learned or applied the lessons or improved their abilities, they were still restricted by the technology of the time. And the fact was there was simply no way to move the number of men necessary forward for a strategic victory in a speedy enough way to keep the enemy from reacting. That's the true reason why the First World War was one of attrition and why it had so many casualties for so little gain. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. 
Do you Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash get Fargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Before we end today, I want to address two specific misconceptions and myths about the war that hover around the doctrine of the various countries involved. The first is the classic lions led by donkeys idea. This is the classic saying that is usually applied to the British army, that the men were brave and smart, but the men leading them, especially back at headquarters, were idiots who had no idea what they were doing and uselessly pushed their men into the slaughtering fields. This is a narrative that was pervasive after the war, but is also something that has less support among historians than it once had. It is one of the many ideas in history that, while now discredited among historians, holds on among the stories of the war. Now, I want to make it clear that the British leaders absolutely made mistakes, and their mistakes cost thousands of lives. They also were not as quick at adapting as maybe they should have been. However, they did evolve, and just as fast as their peers— The exact same leadership that oversaw the great victories of 1918 had been the leaders of the great defeats of 1916 and 1917. Haig and Rawlinson had been there on the Somme. They had been there at Passchendaele, but they would also be there at Amiens and through the Hundred Days. While it's easy to criticize and judge these men based on hindsight, we we should instead judge them against their peers. The French, Germans, Americans, nobody else solved the Western Front. The German generals had victories, but those were almost all in the Far East, where their technological and industrial capacity gave them just as much of an advantage as the British and French would have had against similar opponents. The British army improved over the course of the war, and that improvement came both from the bottom, with more capable small unit tactics and officers, but also from above, from Haig's support and push for tanks, to Palmer's developments of bite-and-hold attacks, to their support of evolving the artillery to be what it was in 1917 and 1918, which we'll talk about next episode. They made mistakes, but due to the problems we discussed previously in these episodes, they had no way around these mistakes. They weren't geniuses, but they sure weren't donkeys either. Our next myth is one that I struggle with sometimes when it comes to how I present information on the show. This is the myth of the general superiority of German troops. This is a myth that goes beyond just the scope of World War I, and also bleeds into the Second World War, and it's one that I've fallen into the trap of perpetuating, I think, almost by accident. There are stories of small number of German troops holding off large numbers of British on the Somme, or the French in Champagne, but these are not where the greatest part of the myth come from. It comes from the East, and these stereotypes are the most pervasive. Generally, they're based around the stories of Tannenberg, the Germans soundly defeating two Russian armies, both bigger than the German force, and and sometimes the 1915 offensives, where they soundly defeated the Russians and pushed them out of Poland, or 1916, where just a few German divisions saved the day against Brusilov. But when hearing all of these stories, it's important to remember that the typical German infantryman was no better than those that they were facing. This idea that the German soldiers were better, stronger, braver, was all part of the propaganda campaigns, which were racially motivated, to prevent, to promote the idea that Germans were just better than the lesser Slavs in the East. This was used before World War I by the Germans, was certainly utilized during the war, but it would find its darkest iteration between the wars and then during the Second World War. The entire driving force behind the Nazi movement was around the superiority of Aryans when compared to other races and they use stories of German soldiers and their victories over the hordes of Slavic savages as part of that narrative. The fact does remain that the Germans were successful in the East, and this cannot be denied, but this has far more to do with the Germans having vastly better logistics, training, artillery, and tactics, instead of of them being superior on a man-to-man basis. The best proof of this was that when the Germans brought Austro-Hungarian soldiers into their ranks later in the war, these soldiers, be they Czechs or Ruthenes or Serbians or any of the other ethnicities of the empire, they were just as effective as the German troops they were serving with. As I said, this is something I struggle sometimes to present properly on the show. I sometimes also fall into the classic 
German narrative of small groups of Germans doing amazing things, but I try to do better. So that brings us to the end of our episodes on doctrine during the war. Hopefully you have a pretty good understanding of where the all the armies of Europe sort of sat in 1914, how they evolved, and hopefully that sets you up to better understand things in the future. Um, a lot of the stuff we've talked about over the last several episodes, we will cover in the narrative main episodes. Uh, things like the attacks of 1917 will be coming up in a few weeks. Um, of course, 1918 will be discussed next year. Uh, and also, artillery will be the topic of our premium episodes, which I've sort of tried to stay away from during these because I knew there were going to be ded dedicated episodes to the big guns uh, starting next month. So thank you for your support on Patreon. I hope you have enjoyed these episodes. And uh, thank you for listening.